So hello, welcome everyone. Um, this is another one of Voices of Global South series sessions. I am not exactly sure how many of you know about this series, but uh, we kick started uh, in November last year. And uh, it has been quite exciting to uh, bring forward people from the Global South who are working in climate action and activism and conduct different kinds of sessions. We have had simulation sessions and uh, we have had some educational discussion, debate related sessions as well. So it is always a delight to be acquainted to newer people in the Terra community. And uh, yeah, so to introduce myself, I am Muskan. I am an alumna of the Whale Sharks cohort uh, of the LFA course. And uh, it has been really exciting to be associated with Terra. I'm also uh, a climate justice facilitator with Terra at the moment. I take climate justice sessions with every cohort. And uh, I also conduct, uh, moderate uh, Global South sessions and uh, activism panel with Terra. So thank you so much again for joining. And I will be now introducing our guest. Um, he's a dear friend and uh, I'm very excited for you all to know what he does and uh, how he came to the climate space itself. So Parvez, he is a 20 year old climate and indigenous communities right activist from the obfuscating mountains of the northern areas of Pakistan, Gilgit, Baltistan, being one of the climate refugees back in 2010. Parvez has been working on ground to help the climate victims to rehabilitate and make them aware about climate change and its impact on indigenous communities. Uh, he also serves as Fridays for Future Pakistan's country coordinator and was one of the founding members of the organization. He's also a part of uh, UNFCCC's official youth constituency, Yango. Um, and it is, it, it, it's a great platform for young people to be associated. Uh, so he also represented his com uh, community in many national and international forums. And the most recent one was COP27, a conference of parties, which was uh, which took place in Sharm el-Sheikh, Egypt last year, uh, and also was a part of COP15, uh, on, uh, which is the biodiversity COP uh, in Montreal, Canada. So uh, welcome, uh, Parvez. We are really excited to have you today. And I'm also excited to have a lot of people in the room, which is really, really great. And uh, I would start with the first question. This is a panel discussion. Uh, this is sort of a question and answer session between uh, Parvez and I for now. And later on, we will open it up for question and answers for you guys. So stay tuned. And uh, of course, uh, uh, Parvez will be here to answer any questions that you have. So the first question that I have for you, Parvez, is that you have been doing incredible work in climate activism in Pakistan. And uh, I have myself seen your uh, journey very recently, which is really incredible to see. So would you like to share a story as a climate refugee and how you eventually ended up uh, uh, being in climate activism itself? Uh, yeah, thank you so much, Muskan. Thank you so much for having me with this exquisite panel of uh, you know people from global south and global north so uh, as you all know that uh, muskan the great you know guy a uh, person from care about climate he introduced me and i would uh, tell a bit about myself like uh, previously from pakistan i'm working with german watch right now in bonn and uh, serving as a country director of uh, Fridays Future Pakistan. So yeah, that's a, a bit background about my, uh, you know, professional work, I should say the climate activism. Uh, so I would start with the very first uh, incident, or I should say the first, uh, you know, extreme weather event, which resulted in the loss of, you know, uh, many uh, lives and uh, people lost their houses, their, uh, you know, ancestral lands and agriculture fields. Uh, because we are well connected with that. And so that's why I'm just, you know, uh, talking about those things. So in 2010, uh, I was just seven years old uh, when we experienced the first impact of climate crisis, uh, or I should say the climate disaster in Pakistan, uh, where we lost uh, almost everything. I mean, uh, our, our place, the village I was living, the school, where I was studying, I was out of school for seven months. And then, uh, yeah, it's really, you know, uh, tough for a person, for a, a, a juvenile, or I should say a minor, to see these traumatic, you know, uh, things in front of him and experiencing that uh, mental trauma. Uh, and, you know, his family is struggling to, you know, find food because uh, obviously we are from the third world country. So 
uh, we do have uh, a struggle in itself. And then climate crisis, it comes to you and, you know, hits your borders, hits your uh, agricultural uh, lanes and the only uh, food source. So it also disturbed our food system as well. But in Pakistan, or I should say in Asia, uh, the climate activism or the climate education and climate literacy, it's quite, uh, you know, uh, not that much popular, I should say, or it's quite rare. So that's why we didn't know about what climate change was at that time. We just said it's a God act. It's act of God. Just flash floods would come, you know, uh, wash it away, and then it's going to be all right again. But uh, we had to build our house again and stuff. And then in 2015, uh, our village was hit again by flash floods and glof. Uh, and then I was, you know, uh, in school, but uh, I wasn't aware of these things. So I took some sessions, or I should say some uh, awareness campaigns by uh, UNICEF and UNDP. Then I came to know about, okay, this is climate activism, uh, climate change. And then from that point, I started my climate activism as I was uh, just a young, you know, uh, a juvenile, but I stepped into the climate activism and then my climate activism started from that point. So yeah, that's the story of my climate activism where I initiated, uh, you know, getting more into it uh, or choosing it as a, uh, you know, uh, as, as, as a uh, right to breathe, as a right to uh, ask for your rights, as a right to, you know, ask for the reparations and uh, the, the sufferings and the mental trauma that we have been through. So uh, who would be responsible for that? Who would uh, need to uh, get held uh, responsible for that thing? So yeah, that was the initial point where I started. Thank you so much, Pervez. Um, uh, honestly, every time it gets me how, you know, um, someone like you, whom I personally know, but also people all across the world are being displaced because of climate crisis. And being a person who has experienced it yourself, it's uh, it's incredibly powerful to hear it. And uh, of course, thank you so much for uh, expressing uh, about your journey. So the second question uh, from my side to you would be that uh, uh, we are aware that the past year Pakistan faced devastating, devastating floods and uh, it was in the news and the whole world was talking about it and you were at the forefront and providing relief work through your organization, Fridays for Future Pakistan. So would you like to sh your, share your experience on the ground and uh, just uh, express uh, what all happened at the time? Uh, yeah, I would start with the first thing, like, I mean, uh, 33 million people were displaced and it's not something that, uh, I guess, uh, three countries in Europe, uh, I mean, Netherlands and, you know, uh, other small countries, they, they don't have that much population in total. So 33 million people in Pakistan, they were displaced. 17,000 schools were damaged and there were lots of things in like the, the infrastructure, the health and sectors and, you know, even the roads and uh, the bridges and stuff. So it was so hectic for each and every one of us being citizen of Pakistan that how to react to that situation, how to, you know, even to reach out to the people who are suffering, who are, you know, uh, we, we didn't have any clue where people are, uh, whether, whether they are alive or they are dead because of the, you know, uh, connectivity issues. Uh, everything was just, uh, you know, uh, shut down. So at the initial point, uh, you know, it was really excruciating for us to watch it on the news and you know getting news from different parts of the uh, country uh, from the southern region to the northern region everything every single piece of the land was you know wet is but it was under mud so uh, as obviously as a citizen of pakistan we had to uh, move on with our plans and with our organization that we have an aim to you know help the people and the destitutes and the people who are on the forefront of climate crisis and they have uh, you know experienced this thing so we started gathering funds from our uh, uh, strategic partners we have strategic partnership with different organizations like german watch we have strategic partnership with giz we have strategic partnership with Pakistan German Climate, uh, you know, Initiative on Climate Change Energy. We have uh, uh, USAID and a lot of organizations. So we started campaigning for, you know, uh, local fundraising and then international fundraising, and we started raising funds for the uh, climate victims. And uh, from the initial point, it was really tough for us because water was running on the roads and, you know, roads were blocked and even uh, the air, uh, you know, uh, health was uh, not in that much, you know, uh, functioning way because 33 million people, you just 
you know, we just can say that those were 33 million people on paper, but if you just experience that chaotic situation going into the places which are, you know, uh, demolished by the floods, it's my personal experience. We were in the Sindh area of Pakistan. We were just in a, you know, uh, a camp where we distributed food and clothes and medicines and stuff. And it was night and the water, the flood just came out. It, it was just uh, 500 or uh, uh, 800 meters away. And we were aware about that. And we just uh, went on our roof. And when we were looking around, everything was just covered, uh, you know, under mud. It was just under water. And everyone was screaming for their children, for their, anim uh, you know, pets and animals and, you know, their uh, cattle farms and their lives even. So that becomes really an excruciating, or I should say a hectic situation for you to react on that thing because I've been through that experience as a juvenile and I have that traumatic experience in my mind. So you don't just, you know, uh, get something really, uh, you know, manageable. But yeah, we did manage some, uh, you know, to provide some relief and funds and uh, medicine and stuff to the people out there. But uh, it's a it's, it's a bit big loss. So it, it shouldn't be covered uh, within one or two billion or something like that. It should be covered under the loss and damage. And we will talk about these things maybe later on. So there are lots of things that we can discuss on international platforms and conferences, so which can be a key to deal with these adaptation processes. Yeah, that's it. Thanks, Parvez. You ex exactly brought to us to our next question. Um, as you mentioned, at, at the international platforms, it, uh, you know, there is a there is an urgent need of financing. So uh, you attended COP27 last year, where we also met, and uh, which was really exciting. And you were given the stage to address the presidency, which is an opportunity which is hard to come by, uh, especially as a young person. So how was that experience for you? And uh, what do you think were the aspects where you benefited and felt represented as a climate activist from Pakistan? Uh, for me, it was my first, even though it was my first COP and my first experience to be, you know, uh, in front of the presidency. And it really is, you know, uh, a pleasure to be, you know, representing the global youth and giving your statement in front of uh, the civil societies and other people and even the presidency, but I don't feel like that we are being kept inclusive in policy making, even in decision making processes, whether they are national or international, because as a youth representative, I do have experiences from national to international level, and we have seen that we have been segregated as youth representatives. Uh, at that time, I didn't understand about uh, understand the things that uh, how do representations and you know negotiations work because it was my first experience. But when I went through all the processes and got into the uh, opportunities and negotiations and stuff. I realized that we shouldn't be kept, you know, just representatives. There should be a youth representative in the decision-making body as well, in the presidency as well, because it's our future that we do need to vote on what should be, you know, uh, prioritized. I, I I don't see our future just giving representations, just giving. Even uh, I I would tell you like. Uh, I was, you know, given a script, I would say, or I just prepared a script that these people in the southern, uh, you know, uh, global south are affected, these people in the global north are affected. So you have to make a decision. And then rest is on the people sitting in front of us. But we should have a representation uh, sitting in front of us as well, like vote to what we have stated, give our statement a strong position in the presidency as well not only, uh, you know, just representing the youth, giving your statements and, you know, just leaving the uh, conference room. So that that's the gap between the younger generations and the generations that are making the decisions. So we are going to push this thing maybe in the COP28. So we have prepared a plan for ourselves and maybe we can, you know, state these things for the presidency uh, that we should have a representation in presidency to make, you know, our, our says in our uh, narratives old in front of the uh, presidency so yeah that's 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 what i felt uh during that you know uh... thank you so much um you you brought very important points and uh it's the, the need of uh, intergenerational justice as we use it as a buzzword now but uh that is that is extremely important in such platforms so Taking you to the next question, how do you see youth representation from Pakistan at different international platforms? Um, you have been to several and uh, you have experienced. 
and seeing what lacks, what it, that can be improved, right? So uh, do you feel that those platforms are inclusive for you, uh, especially being from a country from global south? Uh, actually, I've seen like uh, from my personal experience and the experience that we have uh, seen as a community from uh, the indigenous regions and then uh, representing Fridays for Future, we have a team in Pakistan as well. Like we do discuss this thing as like there is there should be a fair you know representation on each and every platform with each and every you know uh, opportunity given to us. Like we have seen uh, as Global South that there are some faces uh, who are giving representations, who are going on, you know, youth representative platforms and just, you know, making their own say and not even, you know, considering it to be uh, a common discussion or I should say a point of discussion uh, on, uh, you know, uh, maybe in Asia, if I, if I talk about uh, Pakistan particularly, we do have some faces that they would go outside the country, they would just, you know, enjoy that thing as a vacation. Recently, this became a point of, uh, you know, discussion amid the, uh, you know, discussion uh, which we were doing to uh, make a delegation of Friday's Future Pakistan, Friday's Future International uh, at the COP28. So people just go as uh, tourists, they would enjoy the their days there and would come back without any, you know, uh, output or input. So yeah, that's, that's affecting it. And then again, in Particularly, if we talk about Pakistan, uh, we do have issues with our education system, which is not that much inclusive. And then there comes the religious extremism and then the political instability. And there are a lot of things that if you would uh, you know, talk about uh, or against the policies that your dictators, I would say the dictators, the uh, democracy in Pakistan, if you talk about them, if you talk against them, then you would have to face a lot of things in Pakistan because it's not a democratic country and it's not a... Uh, a country that is, you know, accepting the, uh, you know, uh, good views, I would say, from the youth representatives and the youth body. We are a country with uh, almost 60% youth. I mean, they are under 30. So it should be uh, an open platform for us, for the youth to make this say, to, to, to give you a representation, to, 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 to shape your future. So that's the gap uh, I feel like. And in other words, I think uh, Minister of Climate in Pakistan, it's quite, uh, you know, supportive uh, in each and every single representation. So yeah, I don't have any issues with that, but uh, in general, you have some uh, issues within your system. So yeah, that is there. Thank you uh, for expressing that, Parviz. And, uh... As you mentioned, uh, that there are uh, almost 60% young people in Pakistan who want to be represented, but uh, it becomes, uh, of course, uh, it really depends upon the government, how the policies are being introduced, right? So what is your take on uh, climate policies in Pakistan and how inclusive are they of youth? And uh, what do you have to say about that? Uh, for me, I would say it's like uh, uh, out of hundred, it would be seven to eight percent inclusivity uh, when you come to you know discuss about youth because youth in Pakistan they don't have uh, they are not institutionalized that way that we have been demanding you know uh, since two thousand and twenty we are still trying to institutionalize youth but again that's the political instability and the government that is you know promising and. Uh, uh, you know, doing stuff with us, the formalities, and then the other government comes, they just demolish their, uh, you know, policies and just, you know, bring their own things. So that becomes a bit of a hectic thing for us to deal with as youth, uh, you know, bodies, because we do have our own uh, education and stuff uh, on the other side to deal with as well. And then the, uh, you know, uh, the policy again, it is a bit different thing from, because I've work with the uh, European, you know, states, and then I experienced these things in Pakistan as well. There are some issues within the policy uh, level because it's after all a political thing. So you don't have to interfere uh, into that thing and you are not even allowed to interfere in that thing. So yeah, if you are thinking to, you know, uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, make some difference or influence the policy, then you have to be very bold and your people, behind you, they need to be very bold and they need to be very, uh, you know, consistent about it. But uh, according to me, my country, Pakistan, it's not that much inclusive and the um, local government, it's not that much, I think, supportive for the youth. And that's a universal truth. I think uh, most of 
the southern uh, Asian countries, they don't have that much, uh, you know, inclusivity and that much uh, space for the youth to make their say. Even though we are 60%, but we don't have, you know, platforms to make our say and make our, you know, uh, work done. So, yeah. Thank you, Parvez. Um, yeah, very rightly said. Uh, integrating young people is important, but it has been even more more and more difficult. Uh, it really depends, as I said, on the government and how they're trying to... Uh, yeah, it needs to be, I think, institutionalized because if you are, uh, you know, working professionally and institutionalized in a way so that you get, you know, it's after all the finance as well, because we have been pushing this in Yongo as well, that there should be a, uh, you know, financial state for the youth as well, uh, because we are the youth constituency, we are working as with the uh, UNFCCC and we don't have the, you know, uh, a free zone with the, uh, from the financial aspects. So if you institutionalize your youth, you are facilitating them from each and every aspect. You are, you know, building their capacity, you are giving them the opportunities, you are giving them the uh, free rights on their uh, financial expenditures and stuff. So yeah, it becomes a whole thing to uh, a good environment, a healthy environment to work on. So yeah, that's true. Thanks, Pavis. Uh, from here, I'll take you to the next question and I'll bring you back to the finance aspect of things that we were talking about. So um, you mentioned loss and damage in passing and uh, I would like to bring you back to it because last year loss and damage was a key element of COP27 and what you advocated for as well. Uh, so um, tell us more about uh, what uh, the importance of, of course, uh, all of us do know, but from your own experience and perspective, the importance of loss and damages, loss and damage fund and financing facility, especially given uh, Pakistan circumstances from past year, which still uh, the country is still reeling from it and trying to recover from it. So, and, and uh, along with which comes the question of accountability of who's responsible for paying for the fund and uh, uh, what, what are your views on that? Uh, actually, it's like uh, it's not something that we are demanding or that that, that, that should be you know uh, considered uh, an aid. It's it's something that we have achieved from the losses and the damage that we have. You know, I've talked about these things in the past as well. Like we have seen people dying in front of us, like uh, the lake of uh, you know resources. The lake of resources come from the lake of financial aspects, and it's it's not even the finance that we are working on or that we are demanding for. It's the financial instruments as well. Nobody talks about the instruments, right? Like if we do get finance, then what's the next step? We need to answer this thing as well. We are answerable for the aspects and for the financial instruments as well. So first of all, as a country, as a uh, state, uh, Pakistan has lost almost 43 billion uh, from its economy last year in 2022. And then uh, I'd give you an example, like uh, a school was damaged in 2010. It, it is still revitalized, uh, revitalizing process uh, it's going through uh, in 2022 and 2023. So you you can just guess from that like uh, how the revitalization and rehabilitation process in Pakistan is. And it's really slow. So we need to be really you know uh, consistent about the financial aspects, the financial uh, instruments, and the loss. And if if you are talking about the uh, adaptation, uh, for for example, so do you think that you have a sustainable resilience plan if your school was damaged last day? Do you have that, uh, you know, system and that plan and that, you know, adaptation process that your child would go to school tomorrow if the incident had happened last, uh, yesterday? So that's how the game is. Like, we have to focus on the sustainable resilience as well, not on, uh, you know, resilience and not on just the adaptation aspects. So uh, loss and damage finance, it's obviously a very important thing and, you know, an important aspect for, especially for the global South, because we have lost a lot of, uh, you know, finance from our economy in, in the form of infrastructure, in the form of, you know, uh, uh, the agricultural damage, because Pakistan is an agricultural country. So if you are, you know, uh, if you get damaged from your uh, uh, agriculture aspect, then you you are disturbing the whole food system the whole food chain for your country. And it, it's, I guess, uh, around 120 million people uh, living in Pakistan. So you have uh, a really challenging time to feed them and, you know, uh, to grow up again. So yeah, uh, it's not only about pledging or just promising or just, you know, making the drafts. In COP27, we have seen that the drafts were made, but we still don't have, uh, we still don't have that plan that who would fund that and what's the uh, what are the financial instruments and 
and what uh, the plans uh, are for the uh, sustainable resilience and stuff. We are, uh, you know, uh, pretty optimistic for COP28. Maybe they would get some results for, you know, uh, the loss and damage, but uh, I'm not sure about it. But if you are, you know, just uh, just concerned about financial aspects and loss and damage, then you are not going to achieve the sustainable resilience. You have to look on the carbon emissions as well, because you are giving heat to the pot. If you are putting ice in the pot, that's not the solution. You have to, you know, lower the uh, intensity of the heat. So first of all, you have to look on the carbon emissions and then go towards the adaptation and resilience and stuff. So yeah, our fight is you know against both of these things. I mean, the finance, financial aspects, and then again the carbon emissions and stuff. Absolutely agree with you there. And uh, the fact that uh, uh, COP twenty eight is going to be the conference where it's going to be decided who is funding loss and damage funding for city itself uh, is. We everyone is looking forward to it, but uh, again, it's it's a very tricky. Uh, it's going to be a very tricky aspect in the coming uh, conference. So, taking you forward to the next question and one of the last from my side. Um, so, COP twenty eight is coming, and we know that it's the largest international conference, climate conference, where uh, there is a, some possibility of young people to be represented at the national platform. So uh, as a youth ambassador, what I what are you expecting, hoping to uh, for COP28? And uh, how do you uh, how do you feel that uh, youth representation could be made stronger? And even overall, how do you feel that uh, COP28 could be a more could be more successful if these things happened? Um, in my opinion, I guess uh, it's not a climate conference, it's a climate fashion now because every country is just, you know, fighting for the COP to be, you know, organized in their country. It's a climate fashion and that's like uh, a form of tourism now. But uh, if you're talking about the representation that I would just make some comments that CYI, they have, uh, I guess, uh, you know, they have decreased the number of pages to 20, I guess, for the uh, Yongo. Uh, I mean, Yongo is a youth constituency and they have thousands of members in it. And uh, there shouldn't be only 20 pages for the youth representatives from all over the world. I mean, it's 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 crazy. So you are just, you know, uh, squeezing the, uh, the ball of uh, representation from the youth side and you are just giving the carbon lobbyists come there in their private jets and, you know, make speeches and uh, your president is coming with his own dice in his plane and comes uh, to, to your platform to, to cops and you know just gives a speech and goes it's it's just a climate fashion for me uh, a person who is from, from from the indigenous community whose culture has been dis, uh, damaged um, I, I should say it has been dismantled uh, you know uh, willingly by the uh, global north and the countries who are not willing to you know uh, contribute to the climate uh, I would say warm up, and then again, yeah, it's 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 really excruciating for us to see that uh, we are suffering, the youth are suffering, the young people, either they are from global south or global north, they are, uh, you know, concerned about their uh, future, but still the older generation, they are just not looking at the platforms, and they would say just stick to your places, stick to your universities and colleges and study and you know get a job, and that's it. That's what you should be doing, and that's what your uh, priority should be. And what I see at the COP28, it is again that uh, happening uh, in the heart of uh, oil lobbyists, oil and oil, much oil, more oil, and extra oil, and oil and everything is just oil there. I mean, it's Dubai and uh, Middle East. So yeah, if you're talking about the policies and uh, influence of this COP, uh, on the people who are really responsible for it, I think it's none. It's it's just a, a you know climate fashion now. Just uh, you know uh, host a cop and you know uh, give a lollipop of representation to the youth, and they would just you know uh, get you know a happier season to uh, chill out with their boys, and that's it. I think from what I see as a representative. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Uh, you brought a very important point of tokenism in youth representation and other representation, be it indigenous or, or you know, poor representation. It's very, very limited. And the fact that COP is happening at Dubai this year, 
uh, especially since uh, I think uh, even the presidency constitutes of uh, oil lords themselves. Uh, it has become quite ironic that uh, we are moving inching closer to 1.5 C, uh, inching closer to moving beyond 1.5 C, and we are still the leaders that we uh, that are behind these conferences are uh, already in the fossil fuel business, which is as disheartening to the entire youth community. And however, we can only hold our hopes up and try to advocate as much as we can to uh, you know have better policies and have better youth representation. So thank you so much for that, Parvez. And that brings me brings to the end of my questions. So feel free to ask any questions that you want to. Um, it's open for Q&A. If you want to raise your hand, raise your hand and uh, Parvez can answer your question. I can see one in the chat right now. So uh, Jamie has asked the question, do you think there's opportunity to follow some of the strategies of the Sunrise Movement, very effective, uh, all youth-led movement in the West. Is the context in Pakistan too different to benefit? Uh, actually, for me, this I think this was uh, this uh, this sort of question was asked uh, for me at the German pavilion in COP27. I mean, uh, if you look at the perspective of the youth from uh, least developing countries and third world countries, they don't have that much, you know, capability, or I should say not capability, I would say that exposure, you know, to get into these things and to get benefit out of these things. We are just, you know, behind the uh, the policies that have been implemented on us. That's why there is a gap between the policy and the youth. If we are given free hand to, you know, influence the policy, then we can, you know, uh, maybe we can uh, just organize protests, just organize our youth and get benefit of those things. Or maybe we can just, you know, influence the policy and the uh, system that has been, you know, uh, working in Pakistan and uh, obviously in other countries, our neighboring countries as well. So for us, it's totally different. For you, it's a bit different uh, because I've experienced these things, you know, visiting different countries that they would expect a lot from us and they would just, you know, say like uh, step into our shoes and just, you know, look at these things like this. It's not that because we are fighting the climate literacy right now. It's 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 hilarious to tell you, like, we still are fighting with the climate literacy. We are just awaiting our people that this is not an act of God. This is, you know, a climate crisis, and you have to be very, um, uh, you know, uh, understandable about these things. So, yeah, uh, that's a bit different in Pakistan and in other countries, uh, Asian countries. So, yeah, that's my answer for that question. Thanks, Pervez. Um, Suzanne has asked a question as well. Uh, she's she has asked if cops are essentially useless. Where do you think there are maybe areas where there is progress, and where is a good place to apply pressure? Uh, I think for this question, there should be uh, a point of reflection for the for the for the youth of uh, developed countries and for the youth of uh, european states and other us and uh, other states they should reflect on the policies that their elders have already implemented on the uh, developing and least developing countries that they ha they are still controlling it's con uh, you know the colonialism of uh, the great britain it used to be in subcontinent uh, uh, i guess 100 years ago maybe 75 years ago but it still have its roots uh, in those countries which are not allowing them to be independent for their own policies and you know be very verbal uh, about uh, their own sufferings and stuff so cops are not the solution i'm not saying that cops are not the solution but the leaders who are coming to the cop they are not giving the solutions they are not ready uh, to give the solutions our scientists they have already told that we have less time to you know uh, implement your policies and your decisions that you are, you know, taking a lot of time to make. So we have to be very frequent in uh, making and implementing policies and understanding people from different uh, regions and different countries. If you are making policies for your own good, it's not going to be Pakistan again. If it's Pakistan today, then it's going to be uh, maybe US tomorrow, maybe a European state. So it's not about a state, it's not about a region, it's about the humanity. If you are thinking for yourself, for humanity, then you have to be very, you know, uh, consistent about your uh, decisions and your, you know, uh, pledges and stuff. 
if you're coming to the COP, you're saying that we, uh, we, we don't have any intention to reduce our, uh, you know, uh, emissions and we are going to be a carbon neutral country by uh, 2050. I'm taking an example of a country that said this. So then it, it it's, it's, it's really terrible. It's really, uh, you know, a situation where uh, you can find yourself um, in our place, maybe in the next 10 years. So that's again the humanity and that's again the, uh, the goodwill of your people. Uh, if they think about uh, themselves like us, like the way we are treating our uh, policies, the way we are criticizing our policies, the way we are criticizing our leaders, then it can be like uh, a point where they would get, you know, uh, coerced uh, to influence their policies in such a way that cops should be, you know, and and are uh, our last hope. I, I see we have lost our hostess briefly. Um, maybe I could ask you a, a sort of another question. Um, I'm uh, from Canada, long way away, um, many generations away from you also. Um, uh, I was wondering, are, are there any heroes in your country right now that are making a difference in this area? Is there anybody in the leadership or um, even in industry that you think is... Um, is really serving Pakistan in the climate battle? Yeah, we do have, like, uh, uh, it's not a generational gap. If you're thinking about the climate crisis and if you are you think to act about, you know, towards that thing, it's like we are on the same page. And I think uh, we are, you know, uh, in the same generation. So yeah, it's not about the age. So it's about the thinking. In Pakistan, uh, we do have, there was a person in Pakistan whose name was Baba Jan. He was in. Uh, he was kept in uh, prison for seven years for doing climate activism. We have our leaders like Shari Rehman, uh, who was the uh, minister for climate change last year. She made a, a, a tremendous, I should say, a, a very uh, good progress in climate education, and she represented uh, us at the COP27, and she was a successful, uh, you know, minister. And then we have Imran Khan. He is the former prime minister of Pakistan, currently in uh, prison uh, for some charges. I don't know what they are, what they actually look like. He had a vision, uh, you know, to adapt to the climate uh, crisis and the situation that's going on in Pakistan. He made a lot of changes in the infrastructure and even the 10 billion tree tsunami, he launched that project as well. So yeah, we do have a list of people who are working uh, for the climate crisis. And again, it comes uh, to the climate literacy, climate education, sorry. If your people are not ready, if your citizens are not ready to adapt to that situation, if your citizens are not ready to relocate to a different place, which is quite safer, so how would you make difference as a leader? So you have to be, you know, on the same page as a nation, and then you can get, you know, uh, your goals, you can achieve your goals. Either you make a policy, uh, you amend the policy, or you just, you know, uh, ask for a representation on international level. So yeah, we do have uh, lots of heroes. I would, uh, I can name uh, several of them, but uh, yeah, they are, there are. We, we, we have heroes, we, we follow them, we follow their footsteps, and we have learned a lot of things from them. I think Muscon is still not in, but I, I also have a follow-up question um, if you still have time to respond. Um, but you mentioned climate literacy is more the issue right now, and I totally understand that it's like in the U.S. we have a certain amount of awareness, so we're kind of pushing on actually adopting change. Um, but in the, pa the Pakistani context, it's more about actually getting people to broadly understand what's happening. Um, do you find that when you, 
like try, try to have this conversation with the people around you is there even if they they're coming from a place of less understanding what is the like level of acceptance that they have to the idea that okay maybe humans are changing the climate and maybe it is a problem and maybe maybe something should be done um like what is there is there like a general like openness to considering climate change as a concept uh yeah actually it is we are working like we have as a organization as an organization we have uh, like uh, you know strategic partnerships with different universities and different colleges in pakistan and different organizations as well so we propose an idea uh, to the ministry of education that we should you know include climate education as uh, you know uh, into the uh, daily life syllabus as as part of you know compulsory part of the education so we are working on that as well, like from grade one to grade eight, and then again, uh, the higher secondary and then the high school. So we are, you know, uh, working on the syllabus and the education that should be, you know, kept inclusive and in the syllabuses as well. So yeah, it's it's a plan that uh, every single child uh, who's growing should be aware of the climate uh, crisis and climate change. We do, uh, you know, read about the environmental issues, but then there is a problem in Pakistan that environmental issues are being mixed with climate change. So climate change itself is an environmental issue. So you have to be very, you know, um, uh, you know, knowledgeable to, to understand what climate change is and uh, how to differ it from the environmental issues, other environmental issues. So yeah, we are working on the education sector, and then again, uh, we are working in collaboration with different organizations to, you know, arrange sessions and arrange workshops and different. Uh, you know, in different uh, religious gatherings as well. Uh, we are using, uh, you know, verses from our Holy Quran as well to give reference uh, to them that uh, you have some, uh, you know, knowledge from the Quran as well, because it's obviously uh, an Islamic country. So you have to be very, you know, you have to stick with the uh, Quranic uh, verses even more to influence the people in uh, other ways. So, the people there, they are not reluctant, or I should say they are not extremists in a sense, but they don't have the opportunity to get that education. They don't have that uh, opportunity like the others in the uh, global north from their initial uh, you know, stages from the grade one and initial education. So yeah, government is also working, the NGOs, they are also working, the international NGOs, they, they, they do have uh, their stake as well, and the youth representatives, the youth-based uh, organizations, they are also trying their level best to aware each and every single, uh, you know, child, so that there shouldn't be a problem in future that we are facing now. So the people should get, you know, uh, the knowledge of climate change, and then they should uh, represent their youth or they represent their country in a better way. So yeah, that's the plan. Awesome, thanks for responding. Uh, if there is any other question, I'm happy to answer. If no, then I think the host is not going to join us again. So we all have to leave and uh, I, I think that's the end. Thank you so much for sharing your perspective um, from all the way across the world. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.